Well, we've been uh, spending this summer going through really covering John 15 and that uh, wonderful passage where Jesus talked about the, the vine and the branches, how he is uh, the vine and we are the branches and we're connected with him. And, and as we abide in him, we grow and we then produce fruit and he prunes us and we abide in him and we grow and we produce fruit and, and, and you get the whole picture of what we've been looking at is how do we do this and and we've been using uh, seven necessities of life biological necessities of life to uh, talk about this and and now we come to the last two of the series and uh, I, I can tell from uh, your looks that you're most excited about these two because today is reproduction and next week is excretion. So everybody giggles on that. And I want to start off with a passage of scripture uh, today from Matthew 9, 35 to 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Reproduction. Uh, you know, God has really implanted in all of creation this necessity and this desire for reproduction and I got to thinking about this and I immediately thought about some of the kind of bizarre rituals that that uh, some of the animal kingdom go through and uh, yeah I mean I could show that these are going to be okay they're, they're not PG-13 or anything but here's just a little video I put together of uh, three of them and uh, the first one is the uh, uh, Gentoo penguin and uh, Gentoo penguins they, they select just the perfect little rock. You know, the male goes around and, and looks for this perfect rock. And here he is, he's, he's taking it to his, his uh, girlfriend. And she's waiting over there with her back turned to him, see, and puts it down. And she kind of looks at it like, so what? It's a perfect rock for her. But he thinks he's really done something. Watch the way he walks back. Man, he's just strutting his stuff. He's, you know, he's in the groove. He's got his mojo. Go get another rock. And then the, the second one I, I saw was the, the blue-footed booby. And the blue-footed booby, uh, the male, does this dance. And the, the younger the male, the bluer uh, his feet are. And so he's really showing off for his lady friend who's standing there on the rock. And, uh, you know, this, this is what goes on. He's got a great dance. You guys might uh, mimic him. She's just kind of indifferent to the old thing. She's seen a lot of blue feet in her life. Put it up and put it. And I love this move. He's, he's not sure it's working. And so he's got this special move that he's been saving for her. Here it comes. Oh, man, look at that. She goes, eh, ah, maybe. I don't know. And then, uh, lastly, I uh, thought about the flamingos. And uh, the pre-mating uh, dance of the flamingos is famous. These are Chilean flamingos. And uh, <laughs> they get in groups and they do this dance as, in order to select their mate. Pretty hilarious, really. I mean, look at me, look at me. Oh, I love this part. I like to watch this. Does that look stupid or what? Glad guys don't have to do this. But anyway, you know, it's just an example of 
uh, one of, some of the examples that we can show in church of uh, some of the rituals that God has implanted for reproduction and, and you know it's pretty weird stuff and but but then again the the human reproduction rituals are kind of weird too rather bizarre I mean just uh, stand outside uh, Victoria's Secret or a florist or a candy store or Hallmark on Valentine's Day and, and watch the dance of the men as they come in there to select their perfect stones for their ladies. And, and uh, this, this last Valentine's Day, I just happened to be in, because I had mine done, I just happened to be in Kroger about 6.30, 7 o'clock. And, and in the florist department, oh, it was so sad because these guys were just kind of standing there with their money out, you know, and all they had were these little shreds of flowers left and they were, you know, putting them in water and, and some nice bow, bows on them. And the guys were like, oh, you know, give, give me a flower for my lady. Is what they were doing is like, wow, it, it's a wonder, really. It's a wonder that the human race has survived uh, left to our uh, male uh, reproduction rituals. But reproduction is a necessity for life. I mean, the miracle of human uh, reproduction begins with that fertilized egg that becomes a cell, and then the cell divides and divides over and over, and it's, it's such a miraculous thing, you know, that we, we really can't understand how that happens. And as we speak of reproduction today, we do so, of course, with the goal and intention of learning how we can be uh, reproductive, how we can be growing, mature Christians um, who are connected to Christ, who are abiding in Christ and replicating His life in us and then in turn reproducing ourselves into someone else. And if we're alive in Him, if we're living in Him, we're going to be people who reproduce in the same way that, that God made all of creation grow and reproduce. Now, you stop and think about it, it's really a, a rather frightening task to, to think about, to, to go and reproduce yourself. I mean, think about that. I want you to go reproduce yourself. Have, have you ever trained someone to take over a, a position or a job that you've had? And it's your job to train them in everything that you do at work and you know you've got a day or two and you know that's a lose-lose situation because uh, no matter you know how well you train them no matter how well you do that once you're gone oh, what's he going to say well he didn't tell me that when he messes up or you know she, she didn't fill me in on that and to the whole thought of go and reproduce yourself in someone else I mean it's just huge and of course this topic of reproduction when we get to the church is uh, often changed into what's known as evangelism. And the thought of reproducing ourselves, I think, in the church is so huge that we change this task of multiplication into being just mere addition. And what we think is that we need to add some people. And if we could add some people, then we wouldn't have a budget problem. You know, and we could get bigger and we could have more things. And that's, of course, an incorrect attitude, but that's what we think. And then we, the new people, you know, maybe we get a few and maybe maybe they're, you know, just so arrogant as to have their own opinions and not agree with us about everything. And then we've got tension. But, but that's oftentimes what the church gets to, and they call that evangelism. And it's really not. It's, it's not reproduction. That's just kind of sustaining the organization, just maintaining the organization. And that's just pure addition. Reproduction is multiplication. It's not about maintaining an organization and my purposes, but it's reproducing myself and someone else who then in turn reproduces his or herself and someone else. And that's what results in uh, exponential growth because when we reproduce ourselves and our offspring have that same power and that same desire, then it doesn't take very many longs, very long for the generations to, to get just into a, a huge crowd. Now, God's method of multiplication through reproduction is really world changing. Um, in, in fact, um, the, the world changed 
in just a couple of centuries, which is really pretty fast for a world change. Rodney Stark uh, wrote a book uh, called The Triumph of Christianity, How the Jesus Movement Became the World's Largest Religion. And in it, he's a church historian, and he, he says that in 250 years, that half of the Roman Empire was converted to Christianity. And the Roman Empire at that time was, you know, huge. It was from uh, about present-day Iran all the way up to England. And yet it happened in 250 years they became Christians, and it didn't happen by uh, nation conquering. It didn't happen, you know, that's the way the Muslim world really expanded was through the conquering of nations. But at this early time in Christianity, it happened person to person as they reproduced themselves. And it, it just, you know, the, the word was alive and, and the message was alive. And what happened was that death came to the church. It, it really stopped this multiplication when Constantine in, in the year 313 declared that now Christian worship was okay. It was no longer illegal. And then later on, later in his life, when he was converted himself to Christianity, he made Christianity the official religion of the entire Roman Empire. And so now everybody is Christian, and that was really the death of the reproduction. So the question that we have, I think, is do I want to reproduce myself? Uh, do I want someone else who's like me? That's, I mean, that's what parents sometimes fear is that, you know, if I have a child, he or she is going to be like me. And, and we don't think that's ever going to happen. We think that they're going to be perfect in every way. And, and as they grow and develop and they start having some, you know, they got daddy's temper or whatever, uh, they start imitating their parents. And, and then the big fear comes in is, oh, no, my child is going to be like me. And the question is, do, do I want to reproduce myself? I often think of the responsibility of the apostles, of how, you know, early on, the, the 13 apostles, the 12 disciples plus uh, the addition of Paul as an apostle, how they had no Bibles, uh, they had no written literature in order to uh, tell the story, tell the faith, state the faith. But everything depended upon what they said. And so as they went from city to city and as uh, they were missionaries and replicating themselves and the faith was spreading, had they gotten something wrong? Um, it, it just would have, you know, carried on for generations to generations. So it's like if Paul would have said, what's really, really important to the faith is that everybody part their hair in the middle, then those of us that have hair today would probably still be parting our hair in the middle. And everything hung on them. I mean, the, what they preached was, was the, the gospel of Christ, and then it later got written down and then... Uh, codified and passed around the churches. But uh, they also, you know, they said, now listen, um, Jesus uh, said, do all this stuff, but don't worry about it too much. You know, they didn't say that. They didn't say, well, don't worry about doing it because nobody can do it. Uh, no, instead they said, live like I live because I'm living like he lived. And he had trained them to be his disciples. Then he told them, go out and make disciples. So now they're telling others, you know, live like I live because I'm living like he lives until you grow up enough. Now, if we're not giving ourselves away, we're not abiding in Christ. Uh, back to that John 15, one through eight passage. Uh, it's really a natural thing. I mean, this is not work. This is natural. If we abide in him, if we live in him, if we imitate who he is and we desire what he desires, then his Holy Spirit flows through us and, and we grow, we get the nutrition, we get the respiration that we've talked about and we mature. And then what Jesus says in that, in that uh, parable about the, about the vine, he says that, that uh, we produce fruit and it's not a forced process. It's just a natural result of living in him, abiding in him, growing in him because we depend on him. And he said, remember, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
uh, we are daily getting stronger, daily getting stronger in his word, daily getting stronger in his, in his spirit as we receive the, the breath and we receive the, the, the nutrition that comes from him. And all of the results, all of this results in, in the production of fruit. Every tree produces seed and the seed produces another tree that looks exactly genetically like the original tree. It can't produce something different. So that's, that's the, uh, the process here. As we grow and as we scatter seeds of faith, then the reproduction is going to reflect our lives uh, and how we walk with Christ. And there's no way to get around that. Well, we're not going to produce trees that are different than us. We're not going to produce people that are a lot different from us. And that that reality should and does uh, drive us to abide more closely and to pay more attention to how our lives are reflecting him. Jesus gives and we just pass it on. I saw a story about uh, a, a coffee shop in uh, southwest Portland, and um, Portland, Oregon, and the owner was surprised one morning when one of her customers uh, not only paid for her mocha choca something, but, but she also said, just buy the person behind me. Here's some money and buy his too. And so uh, she did, and the other person came up and got his, you know, mocha choca something. And, and um, since he got it paid for, he paid for the one behind him. And this went on and on for 27 customers. One act of kindness was multiplied into 27. Now, of course, the same is true from for a negative thing. If it would be an act of anger or an act of rudeness, that, of course, could be multiplied uh, many times over. But we have this power of reproduction. We pass on who we are and who we believe in. Well, let's go back to our original passage, Matthew 9, now 37 to 38, just the last part of this. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus looks at the multitude and, and considered them, as he said, to be sheep without a shepherd. And, and just think of how much more compassion and concern he would have today if he came walking through our world. Because if they were harassed and helpless, uh, stressed is another word, the condition today is so much more. The harvest is so much greater today. And today, I think he's turning to us, to his body, and he's saying, the harvest is so great, but there are not very many who care. So pray, pray to the Lord of the, of the harvest, the desires that none will perish. So he'll send out his people to care for those who are, who are stressed and helpless. And the reason that I chose that passage so much today for this topic is because of how Jesus tells us to go about this task of reproduction. Yes, it's natural. Yes, yes we're, it happens if we abide in him. But he says to pray. I think that's an unexpected, you know, action plan today in the church. Pray? Is that all there is, Lord? Are you sure that we don't need a better website or we don't need direct mailing or our band doesn't need to be, you know, don't we need a smoke machine or something? Isn't that really what's wrong? And he says, pray. You see, you see the problems around you in the world and you see the people that don't know me that are living in darkness. And he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Now, he gave some other commandments with this. That's not all that he said. Remember, he, he sent the 12 out two by two and gave them authority and they were very successful. Then he sent out the 72 two by two and gave them his own authority and they were very successful too. And then on the day that he left the earth, that he was ascended, he told his disciples, he said, go, go make disciples, reproduce, start here in Jerusalem, in, in Lexington, and then go to Judea, in all of Kentucky, and then go to the world. And he says, as you go, 
I go with you. I am with you when you go. But the going is going to be just a, a natural result of growing. But first he says, pray. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. He tells us what to pray for. He wants there to be reproduction. This is the promise that if we pray that it will happen. So the question is, are we going to believe this? Will his body represent him and the world? Are we abiding in Christ, living in Christ, receiving from him the faith where we believe that if we pray that he will act because he told us to pray this prayer? Maybe as we sit here today, we're, we're afraid that if we pray that he might send us. Might not send someone else, but send us. You know, I, I lived under that for quite a while as I was uh, kind of, God was calling on my life and my wife's life. And, and we were really struggling with whether we would go anywhere. And I was afraid that he would, you know, send us to... Uh, the Middle East or Africa or someplace like that, someplace where they don't have baseball and hot dogs. And, and I just wasn't ready to do that yet. But when we finally agreed and we said, you know, Lord, we'll go anywhere you want us to go. We're yours. Just, just take us and, and we're ready. But we'd rather not go to Florida, you know, uh, anywhere in the United States. But we've been to Florida a lot and didn't really care much for Florida. So anywhere but Florida and within just a couple of months, of course, we were in Florida. So some of you right now are thinking, okay, so if I tell God I'll go anywhere but California, then he'll send me to California or someplace like that. Well, it doesn't really work that way. Perhaps this whole topic of praying for people and for God to draw uh, himself uh, and for us to draw people to himself is kind of intimidating uh, because we don't maybe have the confidence that we know the Bible enough to tell someone else. Maybe, uh, you know, we just aren't knowledgeable in this and we've never, you know, maybe prayed with someone. I mean, that's a huge step to pray with someone. And we're just afraid maybe that we're going to mess this up, you know, that we're going to tell them the wrong answer and, and they're not going to believe and then it's all going to be on us. And I think that's just a really common fear that we might have. But, but now listen to this. Uh, God knows the instrument that he is calling in you. God knows who you are. God knows what you know. He knows what you don't know. And God is the one who does the real work here. And you can't save anyone. It's, it's not all on your shoulders. You can't argue them into the kingdom of God. Nobody comes to Christ through an argument. All you do is just pray for them and just love them. Just be Jesus to them. Just love them like Jesus would love them. And what you don't know, okay, the, 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 the gaps in your knowledge and your experience, God's going to provide through someone else because God does the work. He just says pray. John 6, Jesus tells us this, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Okay, so you can't make him come. Jesus says, nobody can come to me unless the Father draws him. It's not our responsibility, you see, to save their souls. God is the one that stirs the heart of a person. God is the one that awakens the person that's spiritually asleep. God uses us as examples, perhaps, of, of what it means to live in Christ. And maybe they see some of our joy, uh, but that's it. Just let Jesus be Jesus in you because God does the work of the heart. That's not your job. You know, the first person that um, was converted around me in my circle of friends when when we came to Christ was a guy that I'd grown up with and, and we were close friends. We, we had grown up, I, I never uh, remember not knowing him and we were neighbors and our parents were both farmers and we went to the same little church and when we got in our 20s, we both went pretty wild. And then uh, when God drew me to Christ, when the Father drew me to Christ and uh, you know, I was completely changed in one day. And, and this is, is a very rare thing. And, 
and I understood later why it happened to me, but I had this really foul mouth. I mean, if I, if, if I could cuss, I would cuss. I mean, that's just the way it was. I just didn't have a big vocabulary, I guess, and, but I knew some four-letter words. But, but on the day when I began to open my life up to Jesus Christ, it all left. I mean, it just was gone. And it wasn't like, now you have to try not to say those words. They just just didn't even think of them. It just wasn't even a, a temptation at all. I mean, it, it was just a really strange thing, really a miraculous thing. But I found out later why. Uh, my friend and I were spending the day together working. As a matter of fact, we were kind of in the same tractor for a lot of the day. And uh, we were doing some farm work and and I was riding on the fender next to him and we, we talked a lot during that day. And at, at the close of the day, he said something like, he says, man, what is it with you? He says, you haven't cussed all day. And I said, really? You know, I, well, you know, I said, maybe, maybe it kind of has something to do with Jesus. And he said, Jesus. And I said, yeah. And, um, I mean, we'd grown up in the same little church and, and we had been inoculated against Jesus by telling us the stories without any power in them. And we just thought the whole thing was our parents' idea of what, you know, was fun for them and, and torturesome for children. And so we, we never gave Jesus another thought until someone really introduced me to him. And um, so anyway, you know, I told him about Jesus and he says, well, I, you know, what's going on? I said, well, this guy named Tom Key, Tom Key was an insurance salesman and he had come by our house and it sold us some insurance and then it also given us Jesus. I said, Tom Key was by our house and he was, you know, you need to talk to him because I didn't really know anything. I didn't have the slightest idea what had happened. And so he said, well, could you have him come over to our house? And I said, yeah, I'll tell him. And Tom was real excited about the thought of, you know, going over to their house. So uh, he went over to their house and, uh, man, the Holy Spirit fell on that couple. And the same thing happened to them that had happened to Nine and I. None of us had the slightest idea what was going on. See, I didn't know anything. I, I couldn't lead anybody to Jesus. But God was doing the work. All I had to do was to say his name one time. And I don't understand how all this works, but, but I do know that God was waiting on me. God was waiting on me, and somehow I was his partner in the reproduction of another human being in his likeness. And that was all because it was, you know, it was all because of what I didn't say, because God had taken those words out of my mouth, and because I was attached to the vine, and his spirit was beginning to flow through me, and I had an enough sense just to say the truth, that the reason that I had changed was because of this guy named Jesus. So Jesus says, pray. Now, who are you going to pray for? Who are you praying for right now? A child, a parent, a, a spouse, a, a co-worker, uh, maybe a friend, or maybe it's an enemy. Maybe it's your neighborhood. Maybe it's your city, you know, your boss. As God looks over the network of people uh, that he has put you, uh, who he has put you with, uh, people you know, he sees the helpless, he sees the stressed, just like the multitude in his day. And he's waiting for you to pray. He's waiting for us to pray. And he says, I need more people who are growing, who will naturally produce fruit because my desire is that none will perish. I want you to hear that today. That's his desire. This isn't difficult. His desire is that none will perish. Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Did you hear that? That's God's heart. God isn't waiting to punish anyone. He's waiting for all to repent. That's his desire. Is that all those people that you know that are on your heart, God wants them to come to him. It's God's desire that, that he says that all would be saved. And he's the one who does the work. He's the one that draws the people to himself.
We don't have to be clever. We don't have to be perfect. And, and when he looks at this world that's lost and alone and afraid and stressed, and he says to us, he says, pray. He says, shouldn't we have the faith to pray if he tells us to pray, if this is his way of doing it? But here's the test for all of us, I think. We can't ask God to send someone else into this mission field of these people that we see that need him so much if we are not willing to go ourselves. For if we do not reproduce, we are not healthy ourselves and we are not abiding in Christ. As a matter of fact, the most definite action that I know of to increase your faith is to tell someone else about your faith. And in the same way, probably the most definite action to stop your growth in faith is to hide it. And you don't have to get all churchy on them. You don't have to go, you know, a church lady off of a Saturday Night Live. Just tell them about Jesus. You're just telling them about the guy that changed your life. Tell, tell him the simple truth. I was alone. I was afraid. I was confused. And Jesus, you know, I was part of the multitude. Jesus came my way. And he changed that. And, of course, we, we reproduce not to make the church larger. We don't reproduce in order to win an argument. But we reproduce because if we are connected to Jesus like the vine or like the branches to the vine, then it's just natural. It's unnatural to hide it. If we try to hide Jesus, we begin to lose our connection with him. We begin to lose our joy. And I think about it this way, you know, what, what do we tell our children? As your children get older, you're, they're going to have instances where they're going to come up with conflicts with other people. And what you're going to tell them is you're going to say, you stand up and be who you are, right? You're going to say, you be who you are. You don't, you don't have to be someone else for them, but be who you are. Do we tell them you should hide who you are? You should be what everybody else wants you to be. Of course we don't. We say, you know who you are, so be that person. We don't say blend in, be like everybody else, but, but we say, God has made you the way you are, so be that person. And God tells us to be who we are. And if we are branches who's connected to the vine, then there's going to be some fruit. Remember, Jesus said that you are the salt of the earth. He says, so be salty. Don't lose your saltiness, okay? And, and he, by salty, what he means is you preserve things, okay? So you, you're the preserving agent of this culture. So be that person. Don't be ashamed of it. He said, you're the light of the world and let your light shine before others. And then the one that I really like the most where he said in John, or excuse me, um, Matthew 10, 27, he says, what I tell you in the dark, say it in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim it on the housetops. Shout it on the housetops. It's just how he does it. So right now, he is probably whispering some things to you. And you're thinking about some people that you know are, are really confused and, and really stressed. And what he's whispering to you is for you to reproduce, okay? For you to share your faith, share who Jesus is with someone else. And that person will in turn share with someone else. Now let's pray through that. Be washed away 
in the waves of His mercy. As deep cries out.